And there we go. Welcome, everyone. Uh, this is a talk on uh, the use of domains and in the Pulp RPM uh, plugin here at PulpCon 2023. Um, my name is Grant Ganey. I've got a link to the slides here. Um, and I'm just going to give a an overview of what we're doing and a demo, a live demo. So please, fingers crossed, all of you for me, that the uh, demo demon doesn't come and be nasty to me. Let's get started here. The agenda today, introduction. First of all, my name is Grant Ganey. I'm a principal software engineer here at Red Hat. Uh, I have been on the Pulp team for, I th think it's four and a half years now. I've been at Red Hat for entirely too long. Um, what we're going to be covering here today is we're going to do a review of what the domain feature is all about. If you haven't seen it before, it's it's a little complicated. Um, I'm going to talk about the kind of setup that we're going to do and for the demo that you're about to see. And then we're going to go through a demo that shows the use of domains in the Pulp RPM plugin. Um, and then some key takeaways from this from this experience. Um, Last year at PulpCon 2022, Jared did an outstanding presentation about domains as a feature. And there's, I have a link to his presentation at the end of my slides here. If you haven't seen that and you're interested, that's definitely the first place to look uh, to see what domains are all about. Um, also, we have workflow documentation on how domains are used in Pulp Core. Uh, so this is really just a refresher on that and a, a, a demo of, look, Pulp RPM now supports domains for all of your data protection needs. That's the plan. Let's get started. OK, first of all, we're going to do a review of domains. Why do you need these? How are they uh, uh, useful? Who implements them? And a couple of caveats when you uh, decide that you want to use them. So why do you use domains? Domains allow for isolation. Uh, basically, if you're running a pulp instance where you don't mind that whatever users you have in your pulp instance can share content, then you don't need domains. But if you're running a pulp instance where your users want their data to be completely separated from every other user in that system, let's say I'm running uh, an installation where I have 10 different companies, each one of which has their own set of users, um, then I would want each of those companies to have their own domain. So I can isolate their content. I can isolate their namespaces uh, in a single pulp instance. So domains uh, via RBAC isolate API access um, in terms of who's allowed to look at what. And they also isolate artifact storage. So each domain can have its own storage uh, system and its own storage uh, authentication. Um, available to it. One thing that is not controlled by domains is content delivery. So for example, if I've got that 10 company system up and all 10 of those companies have their own repositories, but they want to make all of their content available to the entire outside world, that's fine. They just don't put a content guard on their, in Pulp con, Pulp's uh, context, on their distributions. And anyone outside Pulp can say, hey, I would like to, to curl this RPM and get it. Or I can say DNF install using that, R, that distribution as a repository. So content delivery is not controlled by domains. Uh, that's what content guards are used for. How do domains work? Well, users are given domain-specific RBAC, uh, role-based access control access, uh, to what they're allowed to do and what they're allowed to see. Objects that are created are scoped to the domain they are created in. So if I if I sync content from domain X, all of those packages, those RPM packages, are only available to domain X. They're not visible to any of the other domains on the system. Objects cannot be shared cross domain. So as a user, if an admin has given me RPM admin access, for example, to a repository in domain one and a repository in domain two, I can see both of the, the, those repositories and I can see their content. What I can't do is say, hey, I want to copy the content from domain one, repo one, to domain two, repo two. Even though I have access to both, I can't share across domains. Um, and then storage, as I said, is specified per domain, which means that Pulp's storage deduplication only applies within a domain. If your 10, 10 companies out there have all synced RHEL 7 or Fedora 38 immediate, so they have all the artifacts, um, all of them have all the artifacts. Uh, that the deduplication happens inside of uh, domain storage. 
And the way that you get access to domains is in your pulp settings, you set domain enabled to true. Ooh, that's hard to read. Domain enabled to true and then restart. And your pulp instance will now support, have be, allow you to do the, uh, the domain that you want to do. Some caveats with that. I set domains enabled equal to true. And I have installed a plugin that does not yet support domains. Pulp will fail to start, and it will yell at you very loudly. Um, you can only turn domains on if all the plugins in your installed into your Pulp instance support domains currently. Another caveat is when you turn domains on, the URLs for, th for API content and for um, actually what your distributions show to the outside world will change. So for example, you're, I'm used to getting uh, uh, things from a the foo repo, for example, at pulp content foo repo, repo MD, repo.xml, for example. With domains turned on, the domain that you're getting that content from shows up in the URL. That will be an outside visible change to your system when you turn domains on. Similarly, when I want to talk to the pulp API, once domains are turned on, I have to specify which domain I'm talking to. And that also is built into the API. So you're used to pulp API v3 remotes, for example. Once you turn domains on, it's going to be pulp my domain API v3 remotes, and then everything else will work as expected. Um, there are entities that are not domain specific. So these four sets here, users, groups, access policies, and roles, and in fact, domain entities themselves live in the default domain. That is the, the domain that comes before you've done anything in Pulp. Everything lives in the default domain unless otherwise specified. And it's where the admin is going to set up, the, the Pulp administrator sets up any of these entities. Um, and we'll see some of that happening in the demo. Questions so far, by the way. Okay, I'm gonna move on. So who has domain support right now? Uh, domains were introduced with Pulp Core 323 and anything later has it. Uh, Pulp File at the same time in 113 and Pulp Cert Guard in 1.6. Uh, Pulp RPM 3.22 is the first release that supported domains. Uh, that was back in May, I believe, or possibly a little earlier than that. Um, and recently, Pulp Gem has been released, Point 0.4 has been released that has domain support. Um, I'm not certain this is a complete list. I have in my head that I am missing something. If anyone on the Pulp team can say, hey, Grant, you forgot, just drop it in the chat and I will update the slides once we go. Uh, so right now, given this list, if I want to have all these things and say Pulp Container, I can't turn domains on yet because we don't have domain support yet in Pulp Container. One of the things that is uh, happening in response to um, uh, user pressure, you know, requests from folk in the community and our stakeholders is, and, and we'd like to get an image out there with all of the plugins and have domains turned on, is uh, we're starting to ramp up our work on, or, or aiming at trying to get all the plugins to have domain support added. Yeah, it absolutely would be, Brian. Some of them are easy. Pulp Gem was relatively straightforward to do. RPM was not straightforward to do uh, because of the way that that uh, the the desire to um, do query isolation and protect data using the domain work. And RPM does a lot of complicated things that are not, you know, it subclasses a lot of Pulp Core and then does like a lot of complicated things. It took a fair amount of effort to get it to be domain uh, domain aware, domain correct. Um, so the more complicated the plugin is the more resource it takes, the more people it takes to, uh, to make it uh, domain aware. But it is that's on the plan. That's one of the things we're hoping for is to get everybody uh, domain enabled as soon as we can. Opt out install plugins, Matthias. Yeah, exactly right. If we can figure out a way to, to manage that. You can't have an installed plugin that's turned on and not domain aware when everyone else is. It just, it violates the, uh, the data protection. So. We'd have to think really hard about how to do that. Um, yeah, what I mean is that if we have had a way to turn off an installed plugin, correct, that would make the current ways we build containers uh, work with domains with the compatible plugins. Exactly right. 
exactly right. That's a good point. If anybody has brilliant ideas in this context, please come see us. All right, let's move on here. Uh, okay, so a little bit about the setup that we're, we're about to see. Um, I'm going to start from nothing. I'm going to have, by the time I'm done, there's going to be two different domains. The default domain, which you always have, and you can't name something default and you can't remove it, the default domain and a private domain. I'm going to have three separate users. The pulp administrator, which you start the, uh, the instance with, I'm going to have a user called Robert because he knows about RPM, so his name starts with R, who's going to be the RPM admin for my private domain. And I'm going to have a user called Norm because he's normal. He has no access to anything, just so we can see that Norm doesn't get to see stuff. Um, I'm going to have a repository in the default domain, which has a, a remote and a distribution. We'll see that getting synced. Um, and then we're going to do some experimentation with that setup. Um, one note is in Pulp CLI, uh, which I'm going to be using a lot for this demo. If you don't specify a domain at all, then the default domain is assumed by the by Pulp CLI, um, and we'll you'll see a lot of that uh, in the examples that we're about to go through. Okay, so demo. We have there's going to be a bunch of stuff going on here. The first thing we're going to do though is we're going to set the scene. We're going to show hey what are our starting conditions. Then I'm going to do a quick setup which is going to set up the users and the domains and their roles and some repositories. And then I'll show what, what the results were uh, after that setup. So wish me luck. Here we go. We're going to switch over to my setup. Oh, I failed to leave my system in a virgin state. So hang on. We're going to throw everything away and start over. Uh, what you can see over on the right here is I'm running in the OCI environment, and this is a running pulp instance. This is just to make sure that I'm talking to it. Um, so, and I have a bunch of bash scripts here that I am using to uh, do some setup. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to show where we are now, now that I've uh, thrown away a little bit of data. What do we got? Show me the users. Show me all my users. There's only one. It's the pulp admin. Show me all my domains. There's only one. It's the default. Here's the first place where you can see a domain specific change. This word default right here is the domain name of the API call for that href. How many roles do we have? How about user Robert? Uh, we don't have such a user. How about user Norm? We don't have such a user. How about repositories? We have no repositories currently defined. So this is just to show we've got an empty pulp instance at this point for us to play around with. So the first thing we're going to do is real quickly set up our RPM repository. Um, we're going to do a quick sync. It's a small repo. Don't be too upset. We're going to create some users. And I'm going to go back and take a look at this output just to show you what you're getting from the domain work. And then we're going to check our role assignment. So let me scroll back up through this. And then I'm going to let my screen pause here. All right. So the first thing I'm going to do is create a remote in default. How do I know it's there? Because there's the, the domain name right there in the RPM remotes uh, href, and it's just a standard href, a standard remote, just like anything else, but it only lives in default. Then I'm going to create a repository. Similarly, it's in the default domain. All the You can see default in all of the hrefs here. I'm going to do a sync, just like you do any other sync, typical RPM thing. Now I'm going to create a user, Robert. You can see that this is a user and he's in the default domain because that's where users live. They don't live anywhere else. And this is, again, standard uh, pulp core stuff, our buddy Norm. Now I'm going to create a domain. And you can see that the domain also has an href. It also lives in the default, uh, the default domain because that's where the domain entities themselves live. It has a name. It has a description. Uh, and right now, that's all it has. Now I'm going to tell the system that Robert, the user, is an RPM admin in the domain that we just created called private. So I'm going to create a role for this user right here. Roles also only appear in the default domain. The role name is RPM admin. This is just comes with Pulp RPM. It has many permissions. Here's the whole list of permissions. But this role has a domain associated with it. So this particular uh, RPM admin role is only available to this domain, which happens to be the private domain that we just created. 
And if I ask what uh, what role assignments Robert has, you can see Robert has RPM admin, but only in this domain. What I'd like to do briefly here is take a quick look at the actual script, just to give you an idea for what the commands look like uh, for setting this stuff up. All right. So there's not a lot of magic here. You've seen all of this, um, especially the stuff that's in default. It's just you'll note that nowhere in any of these commands is there a domain specified. Um, we're going to create a user. This is all standard stuff. Create another user. Here's us creating a domain for the first time. Again, it's going to go into default. We're going to give uh, Robert the role RPM admin in the domain we just created. But again, this is still happening in the default domain. And then we're just going to show the assignments. So all this stuff is supported in Pulp CLI. It's all pretty straightforward if, you've, if you're used to users and roles in Pulp in the first place. Um, so that's our setup. And if I go back here, that's where we are currently. So what are we going to do? We're going to do a bunch of things here in RPM land uh, to show domains working in RPM. First thing we're going to look at is repository creation and access. Um, and then we'll move on to doing some stuff with content. So what I'm going to do here is separate the screen a little bit. I have a script. And all these scripts, by the way, are available on GitHub. There's, there's a link at the uh, at the end of the um, end of the presentation. If you want to run these in your own instance, you absolutely can. OK, so let's start with here's a script. So the first thing I'm going to try is Robert, who's only allowed to do stuff in private. Note that he has not specified a domain here. He just says, my name's Robert. Here's my password. I'm going to create a repository, and I'm going to give it the name that I like. So I'm going to go grab that. We're going to copy that. We're going to come down here. We're going to paste that. We're going to say, hey, go. And Robert is told, yeah, you can't. You don't have permissions to do this. He's an RPM admin, but not in the default uh, environment. All right, Robert says, I know where I can do this. Note that in each of these commands that we're about to issue, there's a domain argument where Robert is going to talk to the private domain that has been established or that he's the admin of. And what we're doing here is I'm going to be uh, creating a repository. And I'm also going to create a distribution because I want to use that later on uh, in, the, in the demo. So let's show both of those running and what you get. Here we go. Those look a lot better. So here's Robert doing normal work, except this time he says, I want to create a repository. And you can see the repository href here. You'll note that it is now, this only appears in the private domain. And similarly for the distribution. So now Robert has done his first, his first two jobs as an admin here. Uh, meanwhile, Norm on this system wants to try and read a repository out of default. He's just a normal user. You would expect this to fail because RBAC says, you, so, sir, you do not have access to RPM uh, land in this particular instance. And here's Norm. Norm note, he couldn't, can't even find a repository with this name, even though there is one. OK. So now the admin. I'm going to do this as the admin. I'm the pulp instance admin. I can see all the things. I can see everything in default. And if I specify the domain, I can see the things that are created in the in the domains. Because as an admin, you have access to all of the uh, the pulp content that you want. So what this admin is going to do is, well, first I'm going to grab the uh, the href of the remote that's in my default domain. And I'm going to try and sync the repository that's in the private domain using the remote that's in the default domain, which is essentially a cross-domain operation. So we're going to come down here. We're going to issue that command. And this is the error you get back. Anytime you try to uh, execute cross-domain operations, the, the uh, infrastructure will, turn, will come back to you and say, you can't do that. Even when you have access to all the pieces, you can't do cross-domain operations. So this will happen if you try to copy, um, say, an RPM from one repo to another, and they're in different domains. That's not going to work. If you try to apply a distribution across domains, uh, this is the error that you'll see. You'll see a lot, um, and it'll tell you one of the. Basically, it'll pick one of the domains as well. This is the one you're going to operate on 
and that, but they all have to be part of that domain. Um, that is a thing that you get used to seeing when you're first learning domains, and then it goes away because you're doing the right thing after that. Okay, so the, the admin has been told he can't do that. However, he, he can try and say, you know, I've got a piece of content. It's a, it's a package. I mean, it's, its name is Zebra. Can I see that? Yep, there it is. Okay, I've got a package in the default. Okay, so we're going to go back up and find the URL. This is in the default uh, domain. I have a package. Its name is Zebra. I found it. Life is good. Our buddy Robert here is like, oh, that looks cool. Can I see that package? Let's see. Robert not only doesn't get told you don't have access to that, Robert isn't told that the package exists because Robert does not have domain access to that domain. So he doesn't get an error. You're not leaking information about the names of packages that are in a domain you don't have access to. You're, you're, it's as if the data doesn't exist at all um, when you attempt to do something that you do not have domain access to. This is really important from a, uh, a security standpoint is that you're not leaking data. Somebody can't just hammer at a domain with every possible name, slowly finding the names of every RPM, for example. All right, so Robert's gonna give up on that. What Robert's gonna do instead here is, first I want to upload my own copy of that package, of the Zebra package. The one that I wasn't allowed to even know existed uh, in storage. And now I've uploaded it. And as you can see, the href here is in the private domain. So that upload succeeded. Now, now I'm going to do a, a publication for my private repo that already exists. Because I want to publish that. And again, you can see the publication happened. And then I want to ask that question again. Note that the time when we asked the RPM content list question, we did not specify a domain. And this time, we're going to ask the exact same question, RPM content list name zebra, but we're going to say, I want to ask this of the domain I have access to. And now we can find the exact same package. So that package now exists in our pulp instance twice, once in the storage for the default domain, and then once in the storage for the private domain. And then last thing here, just to show that we are not protecting um, content access from the outside via the domain RBAC. This is a simple, I'm just gonna ask as no user, there's no user or password just defined here. Um, I'm gonna ask, hey, can you show me what's in the, the private repository that's in the private domain of pulp content at this instance? And we should get HTML back and then there's the HTML. And if I go to that, the if I add zebra blah 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 to this, then I will be able to download that RPM. Um, if I do as the as Robert, if I want to protect the content that's in this repository, then I would use a content guard, X509, or uh, you know, uh, there's an RBAC content guard. There's a magic header content guard. There's ways to protect your content, and those are completely separate from domains. That was a lot in 10 minutes. Questions. Uh, one little note about your last point. Content guards yes. are a part of domains, but they're not. Um, so like a content guard would live inside a domain. So you can't Correct. share them across domains because then they would have to attach to distributions inside domains. Exactly but right. As, as a protection feature, they are sort of separate from the domain's protection feature. They're, yes, the entities live in the domain. The Robert, Robert for example, um, I don't know if I gave him, a, I, don't, I don't think I gave that user enough access to do this, but assuming I did, Robert could create a content guard in his private domain and then assign it to that, the private distribution. Exactly right. Um, but the, the uh, domain access, the domain RBAC doesn't get in the way of content access, the content guards that are created do. Thank you, Jerry. That's a really good clarification. Other questions or comments there? Go ahead, Kieran. Uh, can I limit how much storage each domain gets? Uh, Jared, I don't think we have a specific limit. It, because you can have your storage point to a different file system. Uh, it can, some One domain might be using S3, one might be using local storage. Jared, can you talk to that maybe a little? You probably know this better than I do. 
uh, currently there's no way to limit the storage usage outside of limiting the exact storage backing you're using, like going to the storage backing and setting a limit there. Um, I'm not sure if we'll implement a feature for Pulp to be able to do that, because uh, it sounds like something that the admin of the storage instance should be able to manage themselves, and maybe not something that we should allow Pulp to touch. But if there's a big request, then maybe. Brian? Yep. Um, this is, uh, I agree with Jared, it's not clear whether this will be implemented or not. Um, this is a request that I've heard from a few different um, constituents of Pulp. And one of the working ideas is to have a content guard, which is able to, um, or uh, a, a, at some, maybe at sync time for storage um, amounts to limit the amount of data that's that's being written. And so you basically your repository version will, will not be created uh, in that case. Um, I need to get this filed, but if that's something that you think would be useful, it'd be great if you could file it as well. Um, there's so, also, uh, I, I wanted to just point out, um, there's a epic for open telemetry, which is a little bit related to this feature set, um, where we're going to try to start having open telemetry metrics uh, report how much storage is used per domain and how much network is being served per domain um, as well. I'll put a link into the, the chat here as well. Eno? Uh, while we were talking about storage, I was wondering if introducing a per user per user storage quota would be something useful in the future. Would it be per user or per domain? Per per user in domain. Hmm. That would be interesting. That would be complex, I guess, but it yeah, might be useful. Have... Mm -hmm. If I have four users in a domain, all of whom are allowed to run the sync command on a repository, who gets charged when a given repo gets synced is the is a hard question. Plus, deduplication makes it even harder. But not that I mean, it's just ones and zeros, and we're all bright. We could figure something out, but that would take a lot of thought. Um, I would say the way that we do not have a single owner to objects, like we say, okay three of these users have all the owner permission on a repository mm -hmm. that's really hard to say that uh yeah who who's going to have the storage of that repository assigned to yeah and i think it's there's no answer to that question i'm going to push us along here because i absolutely have a hard stop um and actually uh i was expecting to be short and i'm not great questions though uh let's see and I've actually gotten a little further along here than I was intending. So we covered repository creation. We talked about trying to access content um, and seeing W get work. I'm not going to run teardown again because you've already seen it once because I left all my data in my system. All right, so let's move on a little bit here. Um, I've All the scripts that I've used here, I have in the presentation. I'm not going to show them to you right now. Uh, they are all available on GitHub. And like everything else, I suspect, I'm pretty sure that the versions that are in the slides are already at least a few hours out of date. So the GitHub link is definitely the preferred way to see the scripts that I've just run. Uh, Tanya? Uh, folks, I just wanted to add, if any of the topics we want to discuss more, please add it at the end of the schedule and uh, we can get to it on Friday. We have Friday booked for like any kind of discussions which pop up. Um, just a reminder. Exactly right. Exactly right. So just a quick review. Domains are here to isolate API access and storage. Domains are built on top of Pulp's RBAC support. You can only use them if all the plugins that you have installed currently support domains. External content access is not domain controlled, but uses content guard. Also, bonus, I'm glad I stuck this in here. Um, if you look at the commands that were run, that I was running, you'll notice I was typing username and password and dash dash domain all over the place. That gets really boring really quickly. With Pulp CLI, you can set up a profile. And in that profile, you can say, I want this profile to use this user, this password, and this domain. And then every time you use that profile, you don't have to type all that stuff in. And if you make that your default profile, you don't even have to specify profile. You just say pulp, blah, 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 and it'll do the right thing in the right domain. 
Uh, so that's a that is a, a, a useful piece of Pulp CLI. It has made my life a lot easier when doing domain stuff. Okay, um, I actually have to skip questions. I'm really sorry, although you all have been asking really good ones. Um, so I'm actually going to, alas, skip this slide and just say thank you very much. Uh, and there's some links here at the end. This top link is the uh, current workflow documentation for domains in Pulp Core. This is a link to Jared's excellent presentation from last year. Please go review that. And then if you want access to any of the scripts that I've been, uh, that I ran in my demo, they're all up there in uh, GitHub at this link. Thank you all very, very much. And I am going to stop the recording.